Hey, everybody. Welcome to Market Mavericks. You all of your favorite time of the week, Thursday, just before Friday, before the weekend. And you guys get to listen to us go back and forth on some fun things. So how are you guys doing out there? Um, you guys, uh, how are you guys doing on the on the panel with me? Give me some insights. What are what are we looking at today that's going to get people all riled up? I'm like the the meme, you know, the stick, do something. Just waiting for Bitcoin to move, sitting around 40,000. Uh, but I have a feeling that it's going to do something that catches people off guard one way or another. Well, I like that pre-show conversation where we decided we were the three musketeers, not the three stooges. And i am always just been impressed with, I'm Joe Corporate. I've been Joe Corporate since I've been in the business since the 80s. And I'm impressed what you guys do for a living. It's just impressive that you, I don't think you're real though. I think you're holograms. <laughs> I am. I wish. I wish I didn't need sleep. I, uh, yeah, it's uh, but, it's quite the quite the career path we've chosen, at least in terms of social media. But it's it's fun too, right? It keeps us on our toes and it keeps us always learning. And I think that's the biggest thing is you know the market surprises us, it humbles us almost at every turn, and all we can do is try to keep pace. Humility is so important. Well, I'm um I'm, I set up a few charts I want to go through, but I'm happy to go whichever way you. Uh, ah, I, I say my fellow I say musketeers want to go. We'll, we'll kick okay. it all over I, to you. Let's see what might we got. Be a few minutes. I think this to me has been the key theme I've had this year, and I show you in white is the Bitcoin gold ratio. It's been going down since 2021. It used to lead beta, beta on the way up and now it's lagging. And I show that overlaid with the S&P 500. What I added to this though is you have to look at the significance of when it peaked. The biggest pump in liquidity in the history of mankind. So I've gone back and just restudied my history and it shows to me what I'm afraid is it's starting to tilt back down. That's why I've been getting a lot of pick up on my outlook that I think gold might beat Bitcoin this year, but it's doing it now. And you have that classic crocodile jaw pattern where stock market's still going up. It still has that gap below. This is S&P mini and Bitcoin gold's going down. Um, but it's just a question of what it's going to take to reverse. And one thing I added to this is just simply, if you take a regression line in S&P 500, since that you know, 2021 level and the regression line on the Bitcoin gold ratio, you can just see the bent. And also I like the little high there, but I want to tilt over to something that Scott, we've talked about in Scott's program too, but it's directing your attention to the bottom here. That's the VIX index. It's a 12 week moving average minus um, the T-bell rate. And it's the lowest since 2007. So we have like a 17 year low there. So to me, I look at it as, okay, if I'm right that Bitcoin gold and Bitcoin is the top leading indicator in the planet, bar none, which I still believe it is, it might be sniffing out the fact that it's probably new, not, not a good idea to be overweighting risk assets at record highs when volatility is at almost 20 year lows. Now, at the beginning of last year, this level was still quite high. Now it's very low. And this is Scott could probably relate to. I just show you the performance of the S&P um, Bloomberg 20, it's our aggregate bond index since um, bond treasury index since the end of to begin in 2006, it's pretty well buried. That's part of the reason I'm still bullish bonds and treasuries. Gold stuck in the middle. And then you just see gold, um, the stock market's way up there. But I want to point out the macro and then I'll dive in a little. I showed this a little bit last year, but this is the things that maybe Bitcoin gold's picking up on. You can go, I go, I go back, you know, what, 50 years on this one, 40, 50 years. And it's just the unemployment rate at an all time potential, you know, 50 year, almost an all time low, potentially bottoming. And the treasury curve, this is, I take, I'm taking the uh, 10 year, um, what I have the two year, two tens here, potentially body, I mean, from pretty significant, you know, enduring low. So those are signals that, okay, oftentimes when you get these little bottoms, yeah, you get this little magenta for recession. So I want to point over one thing I think that's really significant is just take a 50 week moving average of gold. That's what I show you here. It's breaking out. Okay. So I'm still bullish gold, 50 week moving average, average of S&P 500. Yeah. Maybe it's turning back, turning back up. We see it's at record highs, but I showed you how low volatility is. And then I overweigh with the extreme measure of the yield curve. This is the 30 year yield. Um, minus Fed funds. It's the lowest since 1989. It's not making it easy like it didn't in 2006, seven. I started getting bearish stocks in 2006. It was tough. I feel the pain now, but it took a while, but then all those hedges paid off, but it's doing the same thing now. And one thing I want to show you on gold is I really appreciate when you put gold on the same scale as the S&P 500, which I do here on the right, and overlay it with ETFs. We This is unprecedented. We've never had ETF outflows going down and gold going up like this. So 
I look at it as it's a sign of divergent strength in gold. The reason that gold's still in go going up is because the deepest pockets on the planet are buying China and Russia and the former Soviet states. And the question is, what does it take for this to go back up? And I think it's just going to take the stock market going down. There's no reason to buy gold, as we talked to mention actually pre-show with T-bill rates at 5% and the uh, S&P 500 all-time highs. So I want to show you one thing, and, I'll, and, I'll, and then I'll pause. I love, I just put out my uh, metals outlook, and what I show you here in, in white is the industrial, Bloomberg Industrial Metals Index. It used to, it's the highest correlation among commodities, commodities with the S&P 500 stock market. It's tilting downward, and if you want an indication for a global economy, go to industrial metal. It's it's probably an adult indicator. So this is with the S&P 500, and I really appreciate what, um, what you can see it's, divergence as the crocodile jaw pattern. But if you overhang it with, with, with what Gareth mentioned last week with the Hang Seng, it makes sense. Hang Seng's breaking down. Now, if you're in China, yeah, you're adding stimulus. You really should add stimulus. But if anybody in position in running money like you guys are, you're waiting for that stimulus probably to sell. So I want to dip into Bitcoin. The enduring pivots, 30 grand. That was the key level since, you know, broke above and the biggest money pump in history. And, you know, if you're looking for just, if you're just a pure technician, which I learned in the trading pit, sometimes just ignore all the fundamentals, there's, why not go back to 30,000? But you also see this 100 week, 50 week, and 200 week moving average all kind of converging there. And I want to end with one thing. I went in with a little message I've been playing with. As I and I keep saying this repeatedly is all these people are bullish Bitcoin. I like to say, okay. It's probably going to go up if the stock market goes up. And here's a little test I'll show you. This is a simple function on the Bloomberg terminal. And I'll show you on right, if you, on the right. This is shows, if you just take Bitcoin since 2011, on an annual beta, beta means just for our audience to know, is if the stock market goes up 10% and this asset goes up 20%, that's basically a two beta. Since 2011, which is a very distorted because it's a baby market, but a, and now, now it's an adult market, on an annual basis, the beta of uh, Bitcoin, the S&P 500 is 43. Okay, that's when it was a baby. If you check the last three years, it's really about three. Every time the stock market goes up 10%, Bitcoin's up 30%. But I wanna show you, and I'll end with this, if you do that same little measure with gold, which is very distorted because it's a baby, it's a baby, the beta is negative 65. Mm. So just it's a little bad. fun stuff. I, I went back to 2011, so that's a key. Never question, Scott, very profound question, because I could take it, this is annual, I could take this and show monthly, weekly, daily, for any period, and this is where you get into, some people call it chart crime. I can really distort it, but I just wanted to show annual, big picture, to show you the measure, basically the beta for the S&P 500, or Bitcoin, the S&P 500, the last five years is about three times. Okay, so, and you can just see that it went, everything went down in 2020 and then back up. Everything went up in 21, Bit, Bitcoin led the way. Um, down in 22, Bitcoin led the way. And up in 23, Bitcoin led the way. And that's why I kind of point out here is the risk is we just revert a little bit and go back down this year. That's amazing. It's, it's interesting stuff. So, Scott, I guess kicking it over to you, um, we have this Mike saying Bitcoin yeah, is going to go I, down. Yeah, give us, give us why Bitcoin is not going to go down. <laughs> yeah, here, let me let me uh, find the chart. I just like uh, squished everything. So here we go. Let me see. Uh, oh, uh, they disappeared. All right. Well, I, I'm missing my Bitcoin charts all of a sudden. Let me. Uh, uh, OK, I was looking at here. I was looking at the VIX before. Let me uh, see here. You're going to have to bring someone else's screen up for some reason. My tabs are not working correctly. Um, but uh, here we go. Anyways, this is something you pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago that got me really thinking that I had not been paying attention to, which was that Bitcoin's weekly tapped that golden pocket, the 61.8% to 65% yeah. retracement. That's from the full move down from 69 to around uh, 15. And that was a key level of resistance. Also, you really got me, I'm not going to say bearish, but you got me thinking oh, we gosh. were going to get this dip, and we did. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for anyone who doesn't know, in every pre-having cycle, we get that exact same 61.8% retracement. You know, the last cycle that was that move when we were at 3,000, got back up to 14 something, you know, 13, 8, 14,000, and then all the way back down. But I, I'm still not convinced that we're going to go that much lower right now. Would not surprise me at all. We have a fundamental reason that it could. Obviously, we have GBTC uh, being sold off every single day. We see 500 million to a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin being sent directly to Coinbase. We know exactly what's happening. This is the first time that you can tell exactly where the selling pressure is coming from. There's no obfuscation, there's no mystery. People are selling their GBTC for various reasons. 
But this area right around this kind of 38,600, 38 down to like the mid 37s, this zone that I have pinned here, you guys probably remember me talking about before. This is where we broke down from Luna, right? I talk about it all the time, but the 2022 contagion started right here. We lost that level. It took us four weeks here on the weekly chart to get back above it. It was the really strong resistance on this entire move up. And the fact that we're kind of bouncing to the penny off the top of that right now gives me a bit of optimism that we still at least uh, could see more upside here. But I'm going to be honest, man, and nobody wants to hear this. My new base case, which I expect to be wrong because I expect all of my base cases to always be wrong. But my new base case is the Bitcoin spot ETF narrative is done. Narrative. I think it's extremely bullish long term, but the narrative, the trade is done, which means we need a new narrative, which means we jump immediately to the having, having. which means it's going to be really boring until next fall, right? We're going to chop sideways in a huge range, 30% up, 30% down. Not, this, this won't definitely happen. It's my base case. And then after the summer, like every having cycle, we have that sort of move to the upside and maybe start to go parabolic end of year in 2025. So I think... We could kind of consolidate into a tighter range here, some lower highs, higher lows, and just keep on going. The question I wanted to ask really quick with the reason I had VIX up, I was wondering for both of you, Mike and Gareth, is there a level at which the VIX sort of gives you a signal that uh, it's time to pay attention? Like you said, I mean, we're really, really low here, been low this entire time. You can see the huge spikes up. I mean, that's the Great Recession. This is COVID, right? Um, is there a level on VIX that you watch where you say it's time for me to pay attention that we might be going risk off? Um, I mean, I'll jump in here real quick. And uh, one thing that I watch, and it's not necessarily, so, so basically anytime you get down below 15, I start to pay a little bit more attention. But one of the things that I'm seeing happening on the VIX is right here. So if you look at the stock market yesterday, the stock market was up. Generally, when the stock market's up, the VIX is down. And same thing today, stock market is generally positive. Um, there's a little fluctuation, obviously, with Tesla earnings, but still, I think even the Qs are basically around the flat line, if not positive. But look at the VIX starting to uptick. And what this tells me is that people or smart money are starting to accumulate um, protection. Right. And, and again, I'd be curious to hear what Mike has to say about that as well. But but for me, that's the that's something that I pay attention to, because it's not something that the retail crowd's doing. Right. I mean, the retail crowd is probably going long, all in. They're buying NVIDIA. They're buying the semis. But this is something, again, this little divergence where markets up, but the VIX is also up is something that I get gets my attention. Yeah, I like to piggyback on that one. And one thing, the lesson I learned trading options in the pits in Chicago, and I remember, I, I'm showing that chart of the VIX, is um, I, I, it was a, I was in the pits on the phones. I remember one of the New York salespeople said, Mike, you know, volatility is always mean reverting. Number one thing to remember about volatility, and, and you can, the thing is it can stay low for a long time. As far as specific levels, good luck. I've learned as an option trader, try not to do that. Specifically, when you start getting long, the time decay will eat you. Um, and you have to trade, you have to trade gamma. Um, but be careful. So I just look at it from a macro picture, picture and, and I like to rope in the difference nowadays is T-bill rates are so high. There's not a lot of room for them but to go down. VIX is low. There's not a, room, a lot of room for that to go up. I like to pair the two to show you how significant it is, and they're probably highly related. That's why I show you this chart. Is I don't know, Scott, but I'll just point out at these levels from a macro standpoint, with VIX this low, the stock market at record highs, you look at the difference from last year, the VIX in this measure was quite high. And the stock market was pretty well buried, completely opposite. So value at risk manager, you're thinking, okay, I got lucky. I was smart enough to be long. I mean, if you did, were, for us, it was mostly GBTC. But if you're long risk assets, GBTC was the best one. Are you overweighting or underweight that now? No, your smart money is like, thank you. I know one particular one. I said, thank you. Goodbye. I'm out. Look for the next trade. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. And I, and I do, I think the VIX is a good indicator too of, of the complacency in the market. When it starts getting in the 12s or lower, I mean, to me at least, that's a big complacency signal. But again, complacency doesn't tell you that the markets are going to reverse. That's where I look for individual things like, you know, the 618 Fibonacci retrace, a topping tail, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting. In fact, I just want to show this real quick on my screen. Um, semis. So yesterday I came out and I talked about the semis having a measured move. And I just want to show everyone this because it's this is the type of stuff you're not going to see on CNBC, right? I mean, this is this type of stuff that traders look at more so. And if we take a look at the bull move on the SMH, 
right? If we go to the daily, here's our daily chart, right? So if you go to the COVID low and you take that low and you measure it to the 2020, late 2021, early 2022 high, you get about a $1,212 move up, right? That's a, basically a straight move up. It was incredible. The bull run from those lows, we all remember it, that traded through it. What you do is then you see the bear market or the pseudo bear market of 2022. You take that same low and you do a measured move. And this is always the stuff that just blows me away is that literally yesterday we hit that high, which was exactly the same dollar move that we had from 2020 to 2021. And so for me, that's, you know, I don't know why it works. I don't know the psychological aspects or the, or, or human psychology, but it just gives me an opportunity to say, okay, this might be a spot. This is where it reversed after that type of move here. Here's a measured move, as they call it in technical analysis. And interestingly enough, today we see the semis, which were initially they opened at a new high. They've reversed and are basically flatlining here. And then you look at charts like NVIDIA and some of these other ones, which have just, I mean, the, the market cap expansion is incredible. In fact, they did a tweet earlier today talking about in 2021, all of the combined semiconductor market caps, $500 billion dollars. Today, $4.2 trillion. Three years later, $4.2 trillion in market caps. AI is awesome. Is it that awesome? That's the question, right? I mean, I, I was waiting to buy a gap in the NVIDIA down around $375. Yeah. Here you can see. Remember this big gap here? It's a breakaway gap, so you don't necessarily yeah. expect it to fill. But yeah, we were down here, and I was saying, yeah, maybe we'll come down, fill, uh, at least touch this gap. We were at 400 That was a... Uh, clear hammer there's that long tail you're talking about right through support and off to the races so amazing what do I know? man so I, the one question i have for mike mike you you traded in the late 90s you remember the dot com era does what we're seeing in ai have any replications with what we saw with dot coms i mean obviously the narrative being that you know in the internet was going to change our lives it did change our lives uh, now it's ai is going to change our lives and i'm sure it will but does that create the same sort of bubbles that we saw back then Oh, yeah. Well, it's completely. I mean, it was one thing about first talking about bubbles. The pump we had and the, I would say, all the, the silliness out to the launch of the Bitcoin ETFs to the peak was very reminiscent of those times I remember in the late 2000s and then um, to the peak in 2007. And I mean, this was just a little small, but semis are really seen. I'm going to explain this chart in a second, but oh, classic. It's just one time you have to put your thumb and finger, finger up. And I just remember being on the phones with clients when they all say the same thing. You all see, I have CNBC, CNN and Bloomberg in front of me and they all kind of have the same thing in there. You know, okay, okay, so our price is low and they're talking about going higher, you're supposed to sell. And that's what traders do. I mean, they sometimes you walk in, they're not going to hear them talking and you probably do it, but when you see it in the popular press, you know you're supposed to get out, particularly if you have money in that trade. But there's one thing that Scott said that really struck me and that was volatility in Bitcoin. What we should expect and what I've been pointing out for years now is volatility in Bitcoin will continue to go towards the same volatility as the S&P 500 and um, gold. And that's what I show you in this chart. This is just the, the annual volatility of Bitcoin divided by S&P 500. Now it's about 2.6 mm -hmm. times. So it's like, like that 3x beta. When it, Bitcoin peaked in 2017, it was around um, 12 times. Now it's obviously come off that level, but the key thing I want to point out that your typical professional manager is going to be looking at, um, and not the people that are, you know, trying to shield things. And that is this ratio here. This is the S&P 5. This is Bitcoin divided by S&P 500 total return for a reason, because that's the number one thing in the history of investing that matters is compounding earnings. Bitcoin doesn't have that. That's why since I always heard and since in this business, why people do not like investing in commodities to go for the equities. They do not like investing in gold. They'll go for the equities. And why I think Bitcoin is the same problem. But this is what the risk models are going to show. Since that peak in 2021, which had the biggest reason in history to peak, the um, Bitcoin to S&P 500 ratio has been declining. Now we've had this bounce. And I look at it. It's okay. This was a great time to buy. End of 22, 2023, I'll point to that with GBTC. We had that island bottom. Now it started to tilt back lower. I need to see that show strength. Particularly, I just want to see it. And But one thing I should expect is volatility to roll over is Bitcoin volatility should gravitate. Now it's just more and more participation. Remember, I have an asset that's only 14, 15 years old. Futures squashed the volatility as fully as we had predicted. Bitto and um, Coinbase are part of that. Now it's 
ETFs. Now, here's the key thing. I'll, so I'll make a prediction. I fully expect that might people can push back on all these ETF providers, all the ones that were launched. I'll bet 20% of them fail. They're going to have to give up. They're not going to work. There's not going to be enough money going to Bitcoin. This is what I learned trading commodities and in gold mm -hmm. and everything. And 20 of them, I'd say 20% within a year or two, I'd say, yeah, we're not getting enough inflows. It's not enough AUM. And I, I suspect GBTC is going to win. I'd put that at 80. I'd, I'd oh, flip it. Wow. I'd say 20% succeed. Impressive. What have we ever had? What have we ever had 10, 11 ETFs launch on the same product at the same time True. and have a fee war that put them at a fifth of what other ETFs are at? So, Scott, I that's did, I've done the math. I talked to yeah. Matt Hogan briefly, okay. but I talked yeah. to Steve. Uh, I talked to Steve from Valkyrie. Really, the math is that you have to have three or four billion in AUM to break even at 50 bips, and these are at 20 bips. Yeah, well, how many I'm, of these do you think you're going to get to six, seven, eight billion AUM just to cover their fees? So Ooh. that's that. That will be a key thing. I'm, I think we need to look forward to. It's like when Tesla first bought Bitcoin and sold Bitcoin. God help us if Michael Saylor ever has to sell some Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> I'm going to help the Bitcoin people. But these things, that's just how a lot of you know. Sometimes you just can't make this stuff up, but it happens. It's the um, the, the hopium and the hype and all the flows are coming in, and that's just come on. I just have heard that every time I've been, every time I've heard this from people from commodities and gold, it's like, okay, show me the earnings. So that's the difference. So is there, is there a point, and I guess this is right now, I think we're all in the case that, that Bitcoin is still mostly a risk on risk off asset, right? You know, and, and so it generally, you know, some, it, you could argue that it leads the stock market in terms of tops, previous tops, and even this yeah. top potentially. But at what point does it flip or does it ever flip into the digital gold that, that I think it's destined to get to, and which obviously would not have the volatility, which is kind of along the lines of what you're saying, Mike, is that the volatility kind of gets sucked out and it starts behaving more like gold. Is that kind of it? So here's my base case. Um, about a year ago, I started pointing out, I think crude oil's going to 40, copper's going to $3 a pound, um, corn's going to four, and gold's going to start heading towards 3000 Now, to me, that was predicated on a U.S. recession. It has not happened. I've been wrong. So I'm going to feel or kill that this year. And that'll probably be my outlook for commodities I'll be publishing next week. To me, that's my base case for this year is this recession tilt that we didn't get. And then now we're not going to get is going to flip back to we're going to get. And that's just based on the simple things like long term charts like this. OK, this is the lessons of life um, that um, so that to me is once we get through that, at some point, when risk assets back up enough for a normal recession, and I mean all commodities, risk assets, um, yields go up, and Bitcoin does, then we might see that flip. But we need to see it. Now, that's my base case. If we can get through the end of the year, and I'm wrong, that commodities don't do the normal reversion that they're already doing, which I show uh, here yeah, but yeah, with nice chart, um, buddy, industrial yeah. metals. Do industrial metals are just failing versus the stock market, and they're just following China. Now, China is a par paradigm shift. It the minute President Z did the unlimited friendship with um, President Putin, that was the paradigm shift that we're going to read about in the history books, and that's kilting. You see that here. So to me, that's part of what's everything's going that way. And the one me thing that's holding up the world and, and all risk assets is this. That's the S and P 500. Now, if that yeah. rolls over, we're going to get that bent. Now, if we can get that to roll over and Bitcoin not to lead it down and not to go down on a risk of the basis, you need to see that. That's my point. It's for most people who run money and who've seen, you know, this, okay, great. Bitcoin's great. It was wonderful when no, everybody hated it, but now everybody loves it. It's underperforming. That's, we've never seen that before. They're going to need to see this number, I think, tilt back upward. And that is Bitcoin outperforming the S&P 500 on the way down. And that is, like I say, um, people talk about the halving. I said, yeah, you know what? Bitcoin will go up into the halving if the stock market goes up. This is the way I look at it. So, Scott, it, it, going back to Bitcoin and, and maybe volatility kind of shrinking, I mean, there's so many investors in Bitcoin that are counting on hitting 100K by next year, let's say. Is that is that do you think that's possible or or you think it's going to take longer? That that would be an extremely dampened version of previous cycles if we only get to 100,000. Right. So right. if you kind of take those measured moves from all time high to all time high. It does get less each cycle, right? I can probably find a chart to show you that. But, uh, you know, we've got obviously we went from what the previous all time high over here was around 20. We got up to 69. So three and a half times. Right. If we come back to, you know, down here, we maybe have an all time highs that were I mean, previous cycles, you go to where they were three hundred and eighty nine dollars. You get all the way up to twenty thousand. Right. So, you know, sometimes it's a hundred X and it's a 17 X and it's a three and a half X. Those aren't the actual numbers, but you get the idea. 
Yeah. I think, yeah, I think now expecting a, uh, you know, two X or two and a half X from the previous all time highs would be far less volatile, but you're still talking about 150, 200, 230, you know, really, really big numbers. I think a hundred would be really disappointing, even if we expect dampened volatility. And, and, and for a catalyst to push us there, you think, I mean, mainly the cycle, but the having is part of it, the institutional adoption. I mean, kind of all of these things thrown in the pot kind of get us there. Yeah, I think that uh, the underlying bullishness of the ETF is absolutely huge. I mean, I was just showing the chart quietly. You know, this is a, a dashboard about the ETFs right here, but you got FBTC, that's Fidelity. It's at 1.65 billion. You know, you got IBIT, uh, 1.85 billion. A lot of that is that what's flowed out of that 25 billion that's now down to about 21 on GBTC. But these flows are going to keep coming, even if they sort of trickle down over time. And once this GBT selling is done, this is going to be steady buying of Bitcoin and inflows into these products. And I think that just takes a really long time to hit the market, much like the having supply shock takes a lot of time to hit the market. So I think that we've got all the narratives we need already. Now people just need to be patient and let them actually fundamentally play out. So here's an iteration for that. Um, Saifedean Amos in his book, The Bitcoin Standard, predicted that at some day um, central banks will buy Bitcoin. Now I first read that book, I think it was 2018. I thought it was silly. And now every day that goes by, I think that makes sense. Someday it could happen. Central banks are accumulating gold at some of the greatest pace ever measured by the, the world gold standard i'm sorry the world gold council and there's good reason there's a war going on a couple, there's many wars going on if you just we most of us in america only know about the two main ones that to me will point at some point will probably come that would be an inflection point but it probably the market will probably anticipate ahead of time but that's something i think to look forward to in the big picture long term the final diminishing definable diminishing supply increasing demand and adoption the big picture actually is though if you look at bitcoin as i showed you on that beta it's got basically a very high beta the stock market it shows you what really matters let's prove that doesn't matter anymore that's what i want to see is the proof and so far as like i said last year bitcoin led everything up it got the ETFs, and so far, potentially, if it continues down, what is it down this year? It's the leading loser in my main. It's down 6%. U.S. Treasury is down 6%. It's one of the leading losers this year. If that can change, sure, there's a good reason for it to have that pump because of the timing of the ETFs. But um, if the stock market starts following that, um, then it's um, just simple reversion of last year, which might really accelerate. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm curious about too. Now, quit, we only have a few minutes left. I do want to touch on Tesla today. Tesla getting absolutely crushed. Um, the stock, interestingly enough, had just before earnings broken this key support trend line and was consolidating in a bearish manner. Um, you know, is is this China? You know, obviously they have a huge amount of sales in China. <laughs> What's your take on it, Scott? I mean, like, let's let's. Is there anything there? I haven't dug in that fundamentally. Might have a better answer. I I think that. Uh... In my mind, when you reduce the price of your cars by 10, 20, 30, 40 indefinite percentages on the way down, eventually that's probably going to catch up. Yeah. And yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't seem that complex. The cars are, you know, 30, 40% less than they were. So, so yeah. I do love the history the, um, of roping in Elon Musk with Henry Ford doing the exact same thing, but actually taking a technology that preceded Henry Ford and just accelerating. But, uh, Tesla's uh, PE is six is 70. Okay, it's pretty darn high. <laughs> I mean, it does make money. It's revolution, everything, but it, we all know how this works. It's it's priced in and it's just not easy making money in automotive, automotive business like it may be for Amazon. So that's what I'm showing you. It's a, it's a 70 PE. Um, and what he's doing with cutting prices, I think will work in the long term. So just what Henry Ford did in when he crushed it in the 20s and then got crushed by GM later and all the competitors. But um, this technology, a proud owner of a poor man's Tesla, a, a Chevy uh, Volt, it, it, it's awesome. Um, but I love the plug-in hybrid. I basically that it's it's great for the current technology. I can drive as far as I want, but most of the time it's on electric. Um, but the key thing I think here, remember, is um, if Tesla... I, I remember visiting a hedge fund in, in New York in 2018, and on one screen they had Tesla, and the next screen they had Bitcoin, both born about the same time, about 15 years ago, leading technologies, and they just were, they trade together, and at just some point you know what happens with things, things they, they have to have your typical hangover periods. And what better time than China's heading towards recession, massive stimulus. Uh, Europe's heading towards recession. Um, EV sales have plateaued for now. 
Um, why? Because everything's plateaued. And if the U.S. stock market just goes down for a typical recession, Tesla's a good leading indicator. What's the best leading indicator? Bitcoin, it hasn't well, got near that peak from 2021. Very cool. Very cool. And then lastly, I just want to uh, touch on, we, we touched on oil the last couple of times. I just want to show this chart here. Um, this was last week on, on Market Mavericks. I talked about this inverse head and shoulders in the breakout here, and you can see that that's a bullish breakout. And sure enough, and, and this is a good, good example of how my brain tells me recession's coming, oil should go down, right? And then the chart was saying, no, at least in the short term. I mean, I still think longer term, it's headed lower like you, Mike, but, but interesting to see that breakout right there and the move up. It's actually been a nice move from basically 70 bucks now to 77. Um, are we Mike and, and Scott, I'll, I'll, we could end it on this is, are we headed towards a recession this year or will we have a soft landing? I think I know what Mike's answer is. <laughs> I don't believe in a soft landing, but I do believe they can kick the can past the election. Yeah. So um, first of all, great trade in crude oil questions. How far is it, is it going to go? And what mm -hmm. happens when crude oil goes up like that? It takes Fed tightening out of, the, out of the picture. It reduces all that, which is bad for why, why is the stock market so pumped? It's expecting all the Fed. I'm sorry, Fed easing out of the picture. Um, but you know, my bent is let's keep it simple. Yes. Some of us are way too aggressive about recession last year, but now the pendulum swung so far towards soft landing this year. Well, we'll just let it swing back a little bit in the middle. That to me is the, the first iteration. All right, guys, it's been a pleasure. As always, make sure to follow these gentlemen on social media, and we will be back next Thursday at 3 p.m. So thanks again for tuning in, guys, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you.